Reputation doesn't always match the reality. Take, for instance, Thomas Jefferson. He was brilliant. He was an articulate and persuasive writer. He was a true Renaissance man in the sense that he was very learned and skilled in a variety of subjects. President John Kennedy once remarked at a dinner at the White House honoring Nobel Prize winners from all over the Western Hemisphere in all different subjects. He said, I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge that has ever been gathered together at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Jefferson was brilliant. We read his writings, uh, the Declaration of Independence, parts of which we may even know by heart. And we would imagine that he would be just as powerful and persuasive as a speaker. But he wasn't. In fact, one eyewitness of his first inaugural address as president said, the speech was delivered in so low a tone that few heard it. And four years later, it didn't get any better. Someone else said that it was only partly audible. Jefferson so disliked public speaking that as president, when he was to give the first State of the Union address, he wrote it out himself, but he sent his secretary to deliver it. And that set a precedent for the next hundred years. No president ever delivered the State of the Union in person. They had somebody else deliver it until Woodrow Wilson took that up again. And then from then on, the president himself would deliver the address. Even though he was tremendous with word power, it didn't translate into his speaking. On the other hand, take Simon Peter. He was from Galilee, which in first century Palestine meant he was a hick from the sticks. See, Galilee was hillbilly country. We tend to think of our hillbillies being from the south. Back then they came from the north. And down in Judea they would start their jokes with how many Galileans does it take to and then fill in the blank. He was a fisherman, meaning he was a blue collar worker. These days he might be a truck driver, maybe a factory worker or construction worker. Someone with maybe a rough reputation. And from what we know of Peter in the New Testament, yeah, he probably earned that too. He would have been functionally literate. I mean, he went to school as they had it back then. But he was certainly no scholar. Acts 4.13 says that when the Jewish leaders saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, this was no scholar. Peter was not a a polished preacher by any means. And yet, Chuck Swindoll says of Peter's Pentecost sermon, it was not only his first sermon, it was his best. Now, as we continue in our series of Evangelism 101, Lessons from Acts, I want to draw some truths out of Peter's message there in Acts chapter 2 that apply with sharing our faith today. Now, I realize some of you might say, well, I'm never going to preach in front of a large crowd. Well, my title for today's message is, you don't have to be a preacher to share the good news of Jesus. But we can draw some lessons from Peter's message that we can apply when we're simply sharing the gospel, maybe not with a crowd of thousands, but with a few people, maybe just one. And yet these three elements are vital for our witness if we want to be effective. You see, first of all, Peter's message was relevant. In that passage that Linda read for us earlier, some of the onlookers, as they saw this amazing transformation of a group of people right before their eyes, and they were saying, what in the world is going on here? Some of the skeptics said, eh, these guys have been hitting the bottle. 
They're drunk. That's why they're acting the way that they are. It says, Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, all you in Jerusalem, let me explain this. Listen carefully to what I have to say. These people aren't drunk, as you think. It's only nine in the morning. And understand that in those days, the devout Jews, uh, they only drank wine with their meals. In fact, uh, most of them would only drink uh, when they had meat, a full meal. So their drinking of wine was usually reserved until later in the day. That's why he pointed out the time. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. They're not drunk. Something that is interesting about this this charge. uh, The people said they're drunk with new wine. In the Greek, that is glucose. Yeah, same word. (laughs) It's the same word that we get today. With sugar, it's it's a sweet wine. Very, very, uh, very sugary. And new wine was not... Stronger. In fact, older wine would be stronger, more potent, but it was cheap. So if you imagine somebody saying, ah, boy, they've been hitting the boxed wine, that's the idea here, okay? They, they got the cheap stuff, and they're not watering it down any. They're just guzzling it straight. Peter says, no, no, that's not what's, that's not what's happening here. He turns. In the NIV, it says, no. Some of your translations may use the word but. So it's a strong word of contrast. On the contrary, they're not drunk. What you're seeing is actually a fulfillment of Scripture. This is something that the prophet Joel predicted would happen, and it's happening right before your eyes. He goes on to quote from Joel. In the last days, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. He mentions here pouring out of the spirit. Now, we know that because we've read Acts chapter 2, right? But imagine these folks, if they haven't seen this, they don't know what's going on. It's rather likely they did not hear the, the roar of the rushing wind, the sound of the rushing wind, or see the tongues of fire. All they know is that these people are suddenly speaking in languages they don't know. Uh, there's a boldness, there's a courage that's undeniable. These people are different. Something something strange is happening here. And Peter says this is what the prophet predicted, that God would pour out his spirit on all kinds of people. Young and old, men and women would prophesy. Now, prophesy here does not mean predicting the future. Okay? They were not predicting the score of the ball game later that afternoon. It wasn't like that. Prophesying initially meant speaking forth God's word. So when somebody in the Old Testament stood up and said, Thus says the Lord, they were prophesying. Now, yes, some of that included predicting the future. But here, prophesying simply means they are God's spokesmen. And I don't believe it was only the twelve. You see a group of 120 that were there, and the Spirit came on all of them. And we saw in our last study that all of them were filled with the Spirit and began speaking in other tongues. These were men and women. Some were younger, some were older, some were more educated, a lot of them weren't. And Peter says, what you're seeing here, was predicted back in the prophets. And then he goes on. Again, reading from Joel. I will show wonders in the heaven above and the signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. 
The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord. I I read some commentators that said, well, this hadn't even happened yet. This must be something further in the future. No, it had happened. Think back to Good Friday. Remember when Jesus is hanging on the cross and suddenly in the middle of the day, what happened? The sky turned dark. It was like God reached up and flipped the switch on the sun and it wasn't there anymore. It turned dark. Now, I've heard different uh, explanations for that, naturalistic ways in which you could explain the darkness. It sounds like a solar eclipse, but we know it can't be because it was Passover, and Passover is always on a new moon. So it cannot be a solar eclipse where the moon passes in front of the sun. Others have suggested, and I I could see this as a possibility, uh, there in the desert climate, sometimes a windstorm would arise called a shirako. And, and the, the wind would blow up the dust into the sky and it would block out the sun. Maybe, I don't know. God may have used a natural means for it. He may have just said, let it be dark, and it was dark. Could have been. Now what about the, the moon turning to blood? Now we don't hear that mentioned in the Gospels, but... Scientists, through the uh, wonders of meteorology, can go back in time and they can pinpoint when certain meteorological events happen. And they have determined that on the evening of April 3rd, 33 AD, there was a lunar eclipse that was visible over Palestine. And what happens in a lunar eclipse? The moon looks a coppery blood color in the sky. And April 3rd, 33 AD is probably the best date for Good Friday, historically speaking, not just for that reason. So so think about this. On Passover, which was a big celebration day, all of a sudden, the lights go out in the middle of the day. It turns dark. And then later that night when the moon comes up, It's kind of blood color. You don't think that was a topic of conversation down at the Casey's in the corner in Jerusalem? You know that's what people were talking about. That was on their mind. It was something that was happening. And Peter uses that great idea of public speaking, begin where the hearers are. He started with what was on their minds, what they were seeing right then and there with all these people prophesying, and then pulling out of the headlines, you might say, something that had just happened that they could relate to. Oh, yeah, I remember it. Yeah, I remember that when the sun went dark and, and, and that blood moon came up. Wow. And he's tying it together with what the Bible says. He's relevant. And that's something we need to be. One of the great charges people have against Christianity is that it's out of touch for our times. It's old, it's dusty, it's dry, it's it's for another bygone era. But the truth of the gospel is timeless. And we need to be like that old uh, theologian Karl Barth when he was asked, how do you prepare your sermons for Sunday? He said, I take the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. See, people don't know the Bible, but they know the news. They know what's going on. And if we can show how the Word of God relates to their world, it's going to go a long way in showing the need for Christ. We need to be relevant. Know what's going on. Know how we can transition from the news of the world to the good news of the Word. Secondly, Peter's message was realistic. Picking up in verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. 
again, he's relating to something they know about. They knew what Jesus had said. They knew what Jesus had done. This was something that was being talked about all through the area. Especially now that this this teacher, um, maybe wannabe prophet, some even said he was the Messiah, was executed by the Romans. And he says, you know this. These are things that you're aware of. They happened in your midst. Then he goes on. This man was handed over to you, catch that, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Without resorting to any diplomatic niceties, Peter says, oh yeah, that Jesus that that was executed a few weeks back, you did it. He doesn't blame the Romans. He doesn't blame the Jewish hierarchy. He looks out to all the people and he says, you, you are responsible for Jesus going to the cross. And, And as you go on, you see he just keeps kind of piling it on. He talks about delivered over, nailed to a cross, put to death by you. He doesn't hold anything back. He's very realistic about their guilt. He's not afraid to tell the people of their sin. And that's something that we got to get past. Because we've been schooled that it's inappropriate to say anything negative, right? How many of you, like me, were raised on the line, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say nothing at all? A fellow firefighter in Kenny and I came up with a different approach to that. If you don't have anything nice to say, say something funny. Uh, It works. But what has happened is that we have redefined Christ-like to mean nice. And as Christians and as churches, and dare I say as pastors, we're more interested that people like us than necessarily that we tell them the truth. We want people to like us. We want people to click like on Facebook and become our friend. Now there's nothing wrong with that unless in order to do that we're not telling them the truth if we're not being realistic with their situation. Imagine a doctor who does tests on a patient and discovers they have a terminal illness. There are steps that can be taken. It might be medication. It might be certain treatments. It might be surgery. None of which are going to be pleasant. He cannot even say for sure that it's going to work. But when the patient comes in and sits down for the consultation, the doctor decides, you know, they're not going to want to hear this. They don't want to hear that they're dying. They don't want to hear about all these options, none of which are very good. I'm just going to tell them they're going to be fine. And the doctor says, all the tests came back, it's all clear, you're good. And the person, they breathe a sigh of relief. They get up, they shake the hand of the doctor. They might give the doctor a big hug. Made their day. They're they're happy as a clam. Six months later, they're dead. Did that doctor do them any good? No. In fact, if you could prove that that happened, that'd be malpractice. He might lose his license. And yet I wonder if we aren't guilty of the same thing. The Bible clearly teaches that all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and that without Jesus, we are bound for hell, period. And it's become very fashionable these days in some Christian churches and amongst some Christians To not believe in hell anymore. Oh, how could a loving God 
a God of grace send anybody to eternal punishment. No, that can't be right. Hey, the Bible says it is. Jesus taught more about hell than everybody else in the Bible put together. And the words that he used to describe hell are everlasting, eternal. Not just a simple throw them in and they burn up, they're annihilated, and they cease to exist. That's what cults teach. Unfortunately, that's what Christians are starting to adopt. Why? Because it sounds better. It's nicer. It doesn't turn people off. Folks, we are not in the business of having people like us. This is not a popularity contest. We need to be realistic. And we need to let people know of their condition. We need to be very clear that without Jesus, they're lost. They stand condemned and they face an eternity in hell. It's not going to win you any popularity contests. It's probably not what Dale Carnegie writes on how to win friends and influence people. But it is what the Bible teaches, and that's what we're called to do. We need to be realistic. Peter concludes in verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He very easily could have said, God has made this Jesus, both Lord and Christ. It would have been the same truth, but he put in there, whom you crucified. So there are a lot of people that say, oh, I believe in God. But what about Jesus? Oh, I like Jesus. I like the things that he said. I like the stories about Jesus. Wait a minute. Let's get back to the truth. Our sins put him on that cross. Every single one of us is guilty of the murder of Jesus because our sins put him there. And unless we come to him in faith, accepting his gift of forgiveness, we have no hope. And to pat people on the back and say, it's okay, is criminal. It's wrong. If you were to wake up in the wee hours of the morning... And look out your window and see that your neighbor's house is on fire. And you know they're inside. And you think to yourself, oh, I don't think they're going to appreciate a call or banging on the door at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I I don't want to call the fire department because they're going to come with their big trucks and the sirens. It's going to wake everybody up. I, I just go back to bed. He said, I would never do that. I would call 911. I would run over there and at least try to let them know. Maybe I can't go in and save them, but if I can beat on the door or break a window or something to make them aware. Folks, we face that every single day with the people we know, people we love, people in our families, people we work with, people we live next door to. Our friends, if they don't know Jesus, their lives are on fire. And they're going to burn forever unless we tell them. We need to tell the truth. We need to be honest. We need to be realistic about their condition. Peter was. Now notice verse 37, the response of the people. Luke says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. In the original Greek, that means brutally stabbed in the heart. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? How often in our witness do we get people to that point? That we make it clear that they're in trouble and they need to do something. Oh, we can talk about how bad the world is. Oh, we can talk about that all day long. We can talk about how 
corrupt the government is and how broken our system is and how terrible people are, how violent things are getting, how much we don't like this person or that party. Oh, you, you get a conversation that all day long. But is it really helping them understand what they need to do? Now, thankfully, Peter didn't leave his listeners in the lurch. You know, think about it. He's talking about people who may have directly or indirectly been responsible for putting his best friend to death. Imagine your best friend or maybe a close family member is murdered, and you have a chance to confront the murderer. I don't know about you, my, my temptation would be to say, burn in hell, and I can't wait for you to get what's coming to you. I mean, that would be our natural response. And that's the way some Christians, you know, promote the truth, they say. Burn in hell. God hates you. You're sinners. Now, they're right about that. They are sinners, but God doesn't hate them. In fact, God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. The Bible does say he's not wanting anybody to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. And that's exactly where Peter goes. When they ask, what must we do? He says, repent. I know that's a word we don't like to use very much anymore. Sounds old-fashioned. Sounds judgmental. Repent simply means turn around. Change your direction. Turn away from yourself and your sin and turn toward God. That's what repent means. Don't go on the same path you're on. You're heading straight for hell. Turn around. You're going the wrong way. Change your direction. His message was remedial. What I mean by that is he provides a remedy. He doesn't just tell them what's wrong with them. He tells them what they can do about it. And the heart of the message is repent. Acknowledge your sin, confess it to God, and change the direction of your life. See, they're not beyond hope. And if we take the scriptures seriously, nobody that's breathing is beyond hope. Oh, they might be the most horrible person. They may have done terrible things, but if they turn, if they repent... God will receive them. There are examples of that in Scripture. Some of the most horrible people in history, when they turn to God, they find life. Because there is no sin so great that the blood of Christ cannot cleanse it. That's why he died. Now, it's unfortunate... The English translation of Acts 2.38 suggests that in order to receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, you must be baptized. I hear this preached all the time. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and that you may receive the Holy Spirit. And unless you're baptized, you haven't received it. And it's only when you're baptized in water that you get it. And that doesn't do justice to the passage. The word for for can also mean on account of or on the basis of. You see this in Matthew with John the Baptist. He baptized people on the basis of the fact they had repented. And I don't think we should make this verse teach salvation by baptism. Because it doesn't fit the rest of scripture. If baptism is essential for salvation, why does Peter not mention it in his other sermons in the book of Acts? Why is it that when he brings the gospel to Cornelius and his family, they receive the Holy Spirit and then Peter says, what's keeping them from being baptized? And maybe, at least for me, most convincing of all, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
I'm thankful I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember I baptized anyone else. And then he says this. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now you tell me, if baptism is essential for the gospel, how could he write that? How could he say, I was not sent to baptize if baptism is essential for salvation? It makes no sense whatsoever. Now, does that mean that baptism doesn't matter? No. Jesus said in his great commission, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is the first step of obedience for the person who has repented and accepted Christ. It is their way of publicly testifying to their faith and their way of being received into the body of Christ. But it doesn't save them. I know 1 Peter talks about this baptism which now saves you, but just keep reading. The rest of the verse says, not the washing of dirt from the body. It's not something outside. It is the pledge of a good conscience toward God, something on the inside. Just like when we have... Communion, the bread and the cup are symbols representing the body and the blood of Christ. So water baptism is a symbol of what's done on the inside. We are baptized in the spirit. We are put to death and raised to new life. And it's a wonderful display of that. And I'm not minimizing that at all. In fact, if you're a Christian, you haven't been baptized. My question is, why not? What are you waiting for? But that act does not save. And and I don't want to give the impression from this passage that that's what it is saying. Peter went on to say, This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all that the Lord will call. Again, remember who he's speaking to. These are people who were there when Jesus was condemned to be crucified. There may have been some of them listening to Peter at that moment, who when Pilate said, I'm innocent of this man's blood, we're told in Matthew 27, the Jews told Pilate, let his blood be on us and on our children. And unfortunately, down through the ages, people have jumped on that verse and said, see, the Jews... And all their descendants are guilty of Christ's blood. But what you don't see in Matthew 27 is a voice coming out from heaven saying, So be it. So what that they brought down this curse on themselves? They don't bind God to that. And they were no less or more guilty of Christ's blood than we are because all of our sins put him on the cross. But do you know that's what Adolf Hitler used as his justification for exterminating the Jews? Oh, they're Christ killers. They're cursed. Them and their children. See, right there. That was his justification. Sadly, I've known of Christians that say the same thing. No, that isn't right. But notice, here's the irony of it all. Even though these people said, let his blood be on us and our children, Peter says, this promise, this opportunity for you is for you and your children. God is not bound to that curse. He reversed it. He took the very act of crucifying Jesus as the way for salvation for them and their children. Now, be be clear on this. Peter says, each one of you, so when he says this is open to you and your children, a father could not, by his decision, save his family. We can't be baptized for somebody else, even though some churches do that. God has no grandchildren. You are not a child of God because your parents were. You must do it yourself. Each one must come to that decision themselves. But again, Peter is telling the truth. Yes, you are guilty in God's sight, but God is offering you his grace. Forgiveness of sin, salvation is being offered to the very ones who put his son to death. 
You know, it's very easy for us to look at the sinfulness of our dark world, to throw up our hands in resignation and think, you know, if they want to go to hell, fine. That's their choice. But that's not what we read in God's word. Oh, Peter told them the truth about their guilt. He made it very clear that they were lost. They were hopeless without Christ. But he also pointed them to Jesus. He told them the reality of their guilt, but he pointed to the remedy of God's grace. And we haven't completed the job until we've done that. Until we've shown them the answer, the remedy. Notice verse 40, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them. Imagine that. We tend to think of the apostles as these you know, fiery brimstone, rah, judgment of God. He's pleading with them. Please come and have your sins forgiven. It's a sign of a broken heart. Are we broken over the lostness of people we know? When we think of their destiny, does it drive us to tears? Or do we just, meh, that's their choice. We need a heart for the lost. And as we considered in our last study, the results were astonishing. 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000. Certainly that was the work of the Holy Spirit. But I think we can see why Peter's first sermon was considered his finest. Now the application for us is clear. You don't have to be a preacher to share the good news of Jesus. Maybe you won't speak to thousands of people at once. Maybe it's two or three. Maybe it's one. But these steps can help us be more effective in our witness. Be relevant. Know what's going on in the world And how the Bible speaks to it. Be realistic. Don't dance around the truth. Let them know that they have a need. The problem isn't everybody else. It's us. But be remedial. Don't forget to tell them of the grace of God that can save them. And to whomever it is that God might lead us. We can have the joy of seeing them come to Christ. I'm telling you, if you've never led somebody to Jesus, you're missing out. It is the greatest experience you'll ever know. It's right up there with the birth of your own children because you're seeing a new birth. You're seeing a new life for eternity. And if that ever happens, you're going to want want it to happen again. Tell the truth. Speak the truth in love. Show them the grace of Jesus. That's what we're called to do. As we close, I'd like you to turn in your hymnal. Hymn number 460. Hymn number 460. We just spoke of a time when 3,000 people came to Christ. Down through the years... Millions have come. But this song says, though millions have come, there's still room for one. There is room at the cross for you. It is possible that somebody that's hearing this has, would have to admit, I haven't taken that step. I'm still in that second category of those who are lost. You're telling me the truth of my condition. I'm without Christ. There is room for you. And it's not too late. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter how many times you've turned him away, you still have a chance. And I urge you, I plead with you. Repent. Change your life's direction. Turn to Jesus. Let his blood cleanse your sins. Give you a new life. Will you do that today?